From MTN News, this is Face the State. Welcome, I'm Augusta McDonald. And I'm Jackie Coffin. We make it through the first week of the Montana legislature with immediate bill hearings underway as we started the session with a mind-boggling 4,400 bill draft requests. The session started on Monday with Secretary of State Christy Jacobson swearing in lawmakers. Today begins a new journey for each of you to honor and serve others with dignity, trust, patience, transparency, and kindness. The legislature meets for 90 working days every other year, and this session, Republicans hold a supermajority with 102 seats across the Senate and the House. Bill hearings immediately began Tuesday as lawmakers split into committees to discuss bills ranging in topic from liquor licenses to the state employee pay plan. One of the first bills heard, House Bill 18, which establishes a training grant program for community-based missing and murdered Indigenous people response teams. The bill, introduced by Representative Tyson Running Wolf, a Democrat from Browning, would pull more than $60,000 from the Montana State Fund into a grant fund administered by the Department of Justice. Eligible MMIP community groups could use this money for licensing fees, travel costs, and facilitator and conference fees. In front of the Justice this committee Tuesday, Running Wolf said this type of fund would continue building on the success MMIP groups have already shown. Every Montana has a fundamental right to life safety in these communities to live in their lives without fear. But for too many folks in Montana, this right is violated. That's especially true for Native folks and that's just not right. Right now we have the resources we need to invest in righting that wrong and protecting Montana's safety. It's up to all of us to make that responsibility. With this bill, we'll make strong progress towards that goal. On Thursday, another MMIP bill, also introduced by Running Wolf, was heard in the Judiciary Committee, extending the State Missing Indigenous Task Force through 2025, also adding to the task force a representative from the Office of Public Instruction. A deeper look now at the federal dollars in Montana's school system. Montana school districts have gotten hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funding to address the impacts of COVID on students. MTN senior political reporter Jonathan Ambarian tells us state education leaders are encouraging them to get creative with how they use this money. The federal government set aside almost $190 billion in so-called ESSER funding to help schools nationwide after the pandemic. On Tuesday, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Elsie Arnson, organized a panel discussion to highlight what school districts around Montana have done with their share of the funding. Today's event was trying to promote the fact that the ESSER funds are one, very flexible, and by demonstrating that different districts are in fact using those funds very differently. The biggest pot of money came from the American Rescue Plan Act, with more than $380 million for Montana districts. Leaders have until September 2024 to use the money. So far, they've spent 22 percent. OPI leaders said much of the first round of funding went to technology and health improvements, while districts have since invested in professional development, social and emotional learning, and academics. I think that's really what the story is, is how do we use these funds in a way to do everything that uh, we were, it was just described about trying to keep schools open, how do we recover, and then how do we invest in that academic recovery. But on Tuesday, districts also shared other ideas they've pursued. Target Range School near Missoula used some of the money for outdoor learning spaces. Eureka Public Schools took steps to support a new class on tiny home construction. In Glendive, leaders used some ESSER funds to mitigate a water quality issue at one of their schools. Districts who know very clearly what they want to spend the funds on, and then some event will occur that changes all of that. And so the discussion then is, can we change the use of funds? OPI says one of their goals is to encourage partnerships with community organizations so that districts can make their ESSER funding go farther. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Some of the big tasks right out of the gates, funding the session and deciding the rules of engagement, which Augusta is not as easy as it seems. After the break, you'll hear all about this process and more as lawmakers take the hot seat. Plus, a deeper look at MMIP legislation and what's at stake for transgender rights this session after a short break.
Welcome, welcome to our second week of Face the State. I'm Augusta McDonald. And I'm Jackie Coffin. Nice to see you tonight, Augusta. Nice to see all of you today, Montana, as we're just about done with the first week of the legislative session. And it's a big week for kind of setting the stage for how the session will run. So we talk to um, representatives in the House and senators about how they've set up their rules this session and how that's gonna affect the way that um, legislation will pro progress and basically a lawmaker's ability to move a bill through the process. So first off, we have representative um, Casey Knudsen from Malta. He's also chairman of the House Rules Committee. Casey, thank you for being here with us. No, no one legislature can bind another with rules. Uh, so every session when a legislature gavels in, the rules that govern the previous two years, they automatically go away. And the current legislature then needs to step up and basically say, hey, we want to come up with our own operating procedures. Um, I was the, I am the chair of rules this session and the, the chair of rules is the one that carries house resolution. Sometimes we take stuff from previous sessions Sometimes we feel we need to tweak them a little bit and make them fit our own situation. Uh, there's, there's nothing that stops a legislature from totally scrapping everything from before and starting over completely fresh or the complete opposite, just copy and paste last session's rules and run with them. Um, this session, we did tweak a few things. Uh, I think, you know, I'm, I'm very much of the opinion you need to, uh, you need to uh, customize your governing rules to fit the body that you have, right? Because everything changes every session, everybody changes. Uh, we were talking before the show, there's, you know, about 30% turnover overall every session. So you have to be able to make those, those rules fit. Um, I, I'm a believer that, you know, the rules need to be fair. Uh, they need to, you know, allow you know, true free and open debate. And I, I really think that that's what uh, the rules we put together this session do. Hi, Representative Abbott. Thank you for waiting in the wing. It's good to have you. This is Representative Kim Abbott from Helena, also a member of the Rules Committee. So let's pick up that conversation where we left off um, to kind of have a fluid train of thought about what we're trying to get to here. So we're talking about some of the changes to HR1, which is the, the bill that will affect how lawmakers can push legislation through committee this session. Talk about the changes that were made, and I believe you also filed an amendment on this piece of legislation. Go ahead. Sure. Um, you know, like like Representative Knudsen um, was saying, uh, the rules resolution is what guides us over the course of the session, and we address it every session. Um, our old rules expire, and we have to debate new rules. Um, and I agree with Representative Knutson that, you know, with as much turnover as we have and the context changing, that it's good to revisit rules and it's um, it's good to tweak them and make them work for our context. You know, the Democratic Caucus um, for the last decade um, has really been pushing the idea that the, the power of the body should be held in the majority of the body. Um, and I think Montanans understand that. Like a simple majority um, is how we elect legislators. You know, um, I, I need to get 50% plus one uh, to come to the Capitol and represent my constituents. Um, and so I think that's a that's a clear principle of democracy. It's a clear principle that Montanans understand. And, and so that's what Montana Democrats have advocated for. Um, this, um, this week when we took up rules, um, you know, that was the debate. You know, um, were we going to take some of the thresholds that are higher in our rules down to a simple majority? Um, like the Senate has. The Senate operates um, with a simple majority vote on a number of these um, number of these issues. And it's wonky, and I think Montanans um, aren't in the weeds on our rules. Um, but they do understand, you know, the, the principle of a simple majority. Um, so we ended up um, landing with a majority of members of the body being comfortable with 55 um, as a threshold for a number of procedural motions that'll help us operate um, during the session, help us get things done for our constituents. And so I think, although we're disappointed um, that we didn't get to a simple majority on these things, um, we uh, feel good about our ability to represent our constituents and address real challenges in Montana, like housing, childcare, property tax relief, 
um, with the rules in place, and we're excited to get to work. And did you want me to address the amendment I had? Let's do. Yes, yes, yes. And just kind of like what you were going for, and what I guess what you're concerned about. If there are concerns, what they mean, and um, I guess there's a sense of like maybe some groups will benefit more than others. Uh, a majority or minority group may benefit more than others. Um, depending on how this rule is applied. So, uh, yeah, explain the amendment and then just talk a little bit about some of the disagreements about uh, this change. Sure. As you know, electronic voting became um, an electronic participation, virtual or remote participation became a huge issue last session because of COVID. Um, but for a very long time, um, over 20 years, uh, the House has allowed for le electronic voting. Um, and it was specifically around... Um, a hospitalization issue. Um, that was, I think, the genesis of it. But um, we think that it's appropriate to allow members to participate remotely um, with, with good reason. Um, their constituents should be represented and they should get a vote. Um, and as you know, on second reading of bills, um, you can vote by proxy, but on third reading and on motions, you can't vote by proxy. So that becomes really important um, when, when things are close. Um, in terms of votes. So um, in committee, um, and you can ask Representative Knudsen about this, um, uh, in committee, we added language that said that only the speaker could approve electronic participation. And for me, um, that's hard because I want to be communicating with my members and want to be uh, the one that is saying whether or not they can participate uh, remotely if they need to, um, for a medical reason or another, you know, family obligation. And uh, this feels like it removes the assumption that someone can participate that way and, and puts the power in, in one person. And our, our approach has been the power should be in the body. Um, it shouldn't be with one person. So that failed. Um, that's okay. You know, um, we, we sort of made our case for it and, um, you can't get to 51 on everything. Um, and we didn't on that one, so. And a lot of the uh, the discussion about this was about blast motions, which um, would with allow Democrats and moderate Republicans to be able to bring, or, or any representative to be able to bring um, bills to the House floor, even if blast them out of committee. And that has varied over the years, the threshold that that's counted as, and you've been talking about that 55 threshold now. Um, but some of the uh, more hardline conservatives in the legislature weren't happy about the ability for this to happen. Is that the sense you're getting? What What's the conversation in, been around this in blast motions? Um, the sense that I got is that they didn't like it because it showed up in the vote on the board. Um, but. Uh, and in some pretty heated, and I think, as you guys know, because you watched over the top um, debate, I thought that a couple members crossed the line um, with accusations about our our caucus, with accusations about members of their own caucus. Um, and, you know, it's important to me that we set a good precedent for decorum in the House of Representatives and that we have robust debate um, but that it is debate that follows the rules of decorum, that treats every member with respect, that doesn't make um, accusations against other members. Um, and I know, and the speaker and I have had a number of conversations about this. I know he agrees, and my expectation is that we'll take care of this, you know, going forward. Um, but the debate got a little heated, and, you know, um, we think that a good idea that could get a majority vote on the floor should be able to have that debate on the floor. And the way you find out if it could get a majority on the floor is the blast motion that you referenced, Jackie. Um, you get up, you make the motion. If it gets 51 votes, you know, if I got my way, which I didn't, but in this case, 55, you know, it gets um, a full debate on the floor and then we vote on the bill. Um, so, from my perspective, having a small group of people in a committee prevent something that's a popular idea, you know, that Montanans want uh, and that a majority of representatives, or in this case, more than a majority of representatives would vote for, locking that up in a small committee with a small group of lawmakers isn't the best thing for Montana. 
Um, and so I think, you know, it was a compromise, um, what happened on, um, was it just yesterday? Just yesterday. <laughs> it was yeah. a compromise yesterday. Um, oh, so good. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But on that note, um, we've got the House Minority Leader here. Talk a little bit about what is your feel for the session? You're one week in. Um, we've got a Republican supermajority. We've got a huge budget debate happening um, and lots of kind of key social issues that are going to bring some heat to the session. Mm -hmm. Just talk to us a little bit. Um, what do people need to know about this week? From your perspective yeah i guess uh and, and jackie both of you know because we've talked before um our caucus is diverse and talented and excited to push a platform um that really centers um making the montana economy work for working families um so you have our platform document we have a variety of policies um, on those topics, and we're excited to get going. This week, I think, has been largely organizational. It's been, you know, like like Representative Knudsen said, um, a third turnover. You know, we're all getting to know each other. We're meeting each other. Um, our committees are being set up. We're voting on rules committee by committee. We're voting on rules um, as a body. And uh, we're very excited to introduce some of our key pieces of legislation. Um, you know, and, and that'll happen over the next couple of weeks. But but right now it's largely agency bills, you know, like agencies coming in, explaining what they do um, and little tweaks they need and, and getting used to the process. And, you know, we did, we did have a heated debate on the floor on rules, um, but I think typically um, the first couple of weeks are, you know, bills that we can all get our footing under and, and uh, start to build relationships and get to know each other. And um, I think there's a, there's a lot of energy in, in our caucus, especially we have 10 new people um, in our caucus who are like really excited to get to know the process and get to know other people in our caucus and people in Casey's caucus. And um, so we've seen a lot of that this week. Um, it's like going to the first day of school, you know? Alrighty, Representative Abbott, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. It's always really fun. Yeah, I'll we'll check in with you soon. Okay, sounds good. Bye, you guys. Bye. All righty, let's bump back to Representative Knudsen. I believe we have our technical issues resolved, which is always wonderful. <laughs> One of the downsides of technology, I guess, right? Yeah, <laughs> lots of upsides, lots of downsides. <laughs> So going off of what uh, Representative Abbott was talking about, let's go back to this rules conversation and talk a little bit about um, these blast motions and how they affect um, a legislative process when you have a makeup like the one Montana has right now with the supermajority. You know, I mean, they can affect it. Any of our rules can affect things in a lot of different ways, right? Everything has a purpose. Um, you know, my perspective, I've had personal experience having to blast a bill out of committee. Um, I, I didn't feel like it got a fair hearing. I'm definitely not saying that's the case all the time. I think the vast majority of the time our committees do very good work. Uh, but, you know, a little bit of historical context, it's only been about the last 30 years or so that committees have been able to table bills in committee. Uh, before that, the every bill came to the floor with a either do pass recommendation, which is a favorable recommendation or an unfavorable do not pass. Uh, they determined that there was too much going on, too many bills starting to come through. So they gave the committees the ability to table bills and basically ultimately allow them to die in committee rather than crossing the house floor. Uh, one of the downsides, not downsides, but one of the, the you know things you have to accept about that if you give the committees the ability to do that, just like on the House floor, we have the ability to, to reconsider whatever action we took if we need to. Uh, if the committees have the ability to, you know, effectively kill a bill in committee, the floor, which is the ultimate authority, you know, of the People's House in Montana, the House and the Senate, the, the House floor has to have the ability to say, no, you were wrong. We, we want to hear that debate. Uh, you know, there, there are, are folks out there. Uh, I, I, I'm certainly one that likes to hear all, all different sides of an issue. Uh, you'd be amazed how many times I'll be talking with somebody about, you know, 
whatever issue it might be, we are on opposing sides of the issue. And then all of a sudden something comes out of the ether that just makes sense. And hey, why didn't we think of that? That doesn't happen unless you actually have those discussions, unless you actually have that debate, uh, you know, in an open and fair manner. So uh, I think, you know, the, the blast motion does tend to scare some people. Uh, it tends to, you know, make people think you're undermining the work of the committee. Uh, which I, I can appreciate that opinion. Uh, I just, you know, I don't necessarily agree with it. Uh, you know, I think uh, you need to have a blast motion that is a high bar. It's still difficult to attain, but it's within the realm of possibility. And, um, you know, not every Republican agreed with the set of house rules as we heard on the floor this week. Did you catch any heat from your fellow party members about uh, carrying these rules through, you know, backing them even with amendments from Democrats. You know, we're we're all pretty opinionated. Uh, it's it's interesting when you you get down to Helena and you have 150 members of the legislature that are all Type A personalities. We all think our ideas are best, and you're gonna butt heads no matter who you're dealing with. Uh, you're never going to agree 100% with anybody, and I, I have no problem, you know, as long as people are, are as respectful as possible. I have, I have no problem with people disagreeing with me. Uh, personally, I think it's healthy. Uh, you know, I, I tend to learn more when people disagree with me than when people just tell me I'm right all the time. Uh, but, no, I, it, you know, there's not too much heat flying around. Uh, people generally are pretty good about accepting the fact that we all have our own opinions. We're all independent thinkers. And at the end of the day, the, the body's going to do what the body does. So. And other than house rules, um, I see you have some bill draft kind of placeholders filed. Um, and last, last session, we saw you do a lot of work about around the Milk River and what can we see from you this session now that rules is kind of out of the way? Well, we are definitely, you know, myself and working with some of the other members of the legislature from up in that neck of the woods, the Milk River area, we are definitely working on trying to come up with a solution for that. Uh, you know, it's a program project that uh, is 100 and something years old, and it's, it's in dire need of replacement. Uh, you know, it's been one of the governor's, it has been the governor's number one infrastructure project since he got into office, since his first campaign for the governor's office even. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to working with the executive and the Senate and even our federal delegation with some of the work they've been doing on flipping that cost structure uh, to be able to make it a little bit more affordable. Uh, you know, the way I look at it, most of the uh, increase in cost is because of regulations the Fed, federal government has, has put on things. So, you know, I, I think we should flip that cost structure around a little bit and they, they can pay for a little more too if they're going to make it more expensive. I swear some of the nicest Montanans I've ever met are from Malta. <laughs> it's always nice going up to report on the High Line and saying hello to them. Well, I hope I'm one of them. Yeah, well, yeah, now you are. <laughs> you stuck with us through technical problems, so you're high on the list now. <laughs> Thank you no, so much. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this session, though, just in general. Uh, I think we have a lot of opportunity now. The, the rules are laid out in front of us. Everybody knows what they are. Nobody, there's no more question marks as to what might come out of committee, what might pass the floor, where are we? It's everything is clear cut. And, you know, in my opinion, it's time to get down to work and get the people's business done. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be following following up with you this session. So have a great rest of your week. Yeah, we'll be following Thanks, the Milk River. So we'll see what's going on with that and bring you back on. Please do. No, I, I really appreciate it, guys. Anytime. Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. See you later. All right. Um, we have another representative waiting in the wings who filed a really key piece of legislation this week that's generated a lot of support and a lot of discussion. We have representative... Uh, Tyson Running Wolf um, from Browning. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Yes, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Last minute, but I'm glad <laughs> to be here. We're happy to have you here. You've had, um, you've been in front of committees a couple times this week, all about legislation, carrying bills, 
regarding the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Persons Task Force. Tell us a little bit about the two bills you brought to the Judiciary Committee this week. Well, actually, I only brought the one so far, and then we kind oh, of yeah. House Bill um, 163 to a later date here, probably in another week and a half. There were some uh, issues on some of the funding that we wanted to make sure that we got hashed out before I brought that Missing and Murdered Indigenous uh, task force group bill forward because I want it really strong. I don't want to have no issues and no problems when we get ready to bring it forward. But we did bring bill, um, House Bill 18 forward. And it was uh, one that came out of our State Tribal Relations Committee, interim committee during the um, interim session. And um, I was tasked with bringing it forward as being the chairman of that committee. And I was really happy to bring it forward, no problems. And it uh, basically was about um, missing persons in Montana and making sure that um, it was a community-based missing persons response grant that's available out there, not just for Native communities, but for all communities that have local-based action groups that are on the ground that are search and rescue and peer support groups and canine units and all of the ones that are not federally funded but want to be players in the game. And they've uh, been active in their communities at the local level, but they've never had the mechanism to really have the funds or a place to get funds uh, to help them as a united front. And so this grant program that will be out there will be, will establish an account for them so that we can set up the, the dollars that we're, we're asking for for this session. And then also from private donors that have, um, uh, that want to contribute to that effort. Sometimes the donors that sit out there don't directly want to just give it to uh, the people without any kind of um, uh, mechanism to move that money. And this setting up this account will really be uh, crucial to help them first responders that are not direct agency funder or um, responders and don't um, don't have the capabilities to um, get the adequate training that they need right away. And so this will be a training equipment grant, kind of a, a train the trainer a grant to help all of the search and rescue community out there. This is a really interesting solution um, coming yeah. out of I, I think maybe we've observed in the past few years, like a growing um, effort among community groups. I'm thinking of groups in uh, Missoula that search for Jermaine Charlo and are still doing searches for Jermaine Charlo, um, uh, who went missing. I think that was 20, I want to say 2019. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Um, so, so this is kind of a uh, so we know that it's federal agencies that are responsible for the safety of indigenous communities. Um, they might be very short staffed and not have enough people around to respond immediately to um, someone who is missing or endangered. Um, so, so set the stage a little bit for us about why this solution rose to the top in terms of this task force trying to develop mechanisms with resources that are already available, these community groups that are interested in doing something. Um, just talk a little bit about how this came together and identifying this as a, a good uh, big step um, this session? Well, you, you talk about, um, well, first, this bill was brought through last last session and it made it all the way almost to the end, but I don't think people could grasp the concept that it was really setting up that account so that funds could get to the local level. And that's where we always kind of drop the ball when we're trying to help that local control and at that critical time frame, because that in that critical time frame from the first couple hours to the first 24 hours, you have law enforcement people working with volunteers and other agencies right there. And sometimes the volunteers and the, the local people that are involved have the local knowledge of the things that are happening out there. And sometimes them folks that are there at the ground level that are vested in their communities that are their own people have the best intentions, but sometimes they don't have the greatest training or sometimes they don't have the 
best communication of dissemination through the information that's at hand. And so they kind of either get left out of the loop because of the lack of knowledge, lack of communication, and also lack of training. So if they see an incentive of building these little small task force of these folks that are volunteers and at that local level, and they have the adequate training, it is the most effective time for preserving that site in either capturing a perpetrator or finding a person that's really lost and missing at that time and moment. So it really is boots on the ground, action oriented, call to action kind of legislation that is really what Montana is based on. And Representative Running Wolf, I, I want to ask you about the task force in general. We've had it funded a couple sessions now, um, and it's been used, looked at nationally as a model yep. for how well this can be done. Um, tell me a little bit about the task force and and the example it's setting in, address, in addressing the MMIP crisis. Yeah, well, one of the best things that's with the task force, again, is the appointment of the correct people that are at the table, working with the governor's office on, and um, working with the attorney general or um, the yeah, attorney's general office on a centennial project on getting that database built and the access and ease of using it. So the task force is right involved with the Department of Justice on developing what really needs to happen there. And there's 17 different players that are all involved sitting at the table trying to figure this out and trying to break down them barriers of jurisdiction. And that's what's always been there. And jurisdiction is on the second the second thought and finding the persons on the first thought of, of how it's been. And it's really, caused local people to use all the resources available of technology, of multimedia, and this new database that sits out there. So I think that's why the this project's been so good. Um, you know, that revising and extending the Missing Indigenous Persons Task Force Group, that bill HD 163, like I said, is going to be uh, out here in another um, week and a half. And we wanted to get it right, even though things are going right, we wanted to make sure we get it totally right because we know the whole nation is watching and even people across the border in Canada, which Missing Murdered Indigenous uh, Women Movement was the very first one that started and then it went to the Indigenous persons and in persons in general. So we've kind of expanded it right hand in hand together across border and across uh, the whole nation. Um, one of the key points that's sitting out there on that revising the extended um, missing Persian is, uh, Indigenous Persons Task Force Group is making sure that we get a, a full-time position that's dedicated to hap of helping the effort. Another key point that sits out there is giving some local control to like uh, the Blackfeet Community College in maintaining that database that sits out there and seeing what's working and making sure that they're they're getting the right resources available to help them to um, get the right input into the into the database and being accessible. And then, um, if I remember correctly from last session, and and correct me if I'm wrong, we, there were some. Um, plans for interim studies from the legislature to look deeper into this issue as well as maybe some of the causes of what's um, of what's happening and perpetuating the crisis of MMI, MMIP. Um, did those go through? Is there any information or any reports coming from that this well, session or are those still in the works? Well, they're still in the works. We even have two new joint resolutions. I kind of had to write them down to make sure I got them right that come out of the interim study and that was uh, requesting an interim study for missing youth. That's just directly for the youth. And then the other one is urging Congress to fully fund public safety and law enforcement agency program services and activities within the Montana reservations. Because we know, like we talked about earlier in this, um, in this uh, face the state, is that a lot of the jurisdictional responsibility does fall back on the federal government 
in making sure that it's also highlighted in part of their main objective of helping tribes help themselves. And um, back to the renewal of the task force, um, there's language, language that would also add a member from the Office of Public Instruction to that task force. Is that related to missing youth or why bring in someone from OPI? That, that is related to missing youth also. And we also think that there's resources that, that, um, are, that OPI has insight. And I think they should have been sitting at the table in the very beginning that they'll have this dedication of, of having that insight of different avenues to add to this already special program that we have going. And um, so looking around at the Tribal Caucus this session, uh, what other what other bills, what other priorities are you guys bringing to the table? What what kind of rises to the top? Well, the one of the, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that sit out there that's rising to the top is we already know the cutting the red tape stuff that uh, the governor is pushing through his administrative office on kind of making sure some of the boards are um, are adequate boards. But on our side as the Native Caucus, we got to make sure that we don't lose our seat at the table on these boards. Let it be fish and wildlife boards, let it be uh, hazardous material and um, disaster emergency services board, health and human services board, any board that sits out there, we, we, we keep it as a priority that we fight to keep our native communities sitting at the table so they're not on the menu. And do you think there's a threat of that? You know, it's a fight to keep, like, I love that, the seat at the table so you're not on the menu. Um, do, you, do you kind of feel like that's in, uh, there's pressure that that's happening in any way, that you guys are getting cut from boards? <laughs> Well, well, we have a very long history for 245 years of um, wanting to make sure that we we're at the table and always being promised that we'd be sitting at the table. And um, sometimes we just didn't have the voice to say it, but I think we have such a strong caucus right now with um, returning members, both in the House and the Senate, that have that obligation to make sure that uh, we're at the table and that we're always have that suspicion that for some reason we're gonna be left out. Representative Randall, one more um, kind of broader thought almost about the opportunity that this task force has right now in terms of, um, there's almost a, I guess is my interpretation, but it almost feels like there's some momentum right now Yep. in um, both the, at the federal level, at the state level, um, like you were saying, internationally, Canada also, Canada also addressing its missing and murdered Indigenous peoples crisis, which has been a centuries long. But now um, there seems to be awareness, there's data, there's tracking, there's all of these things that have even been uh, funded, tools that have been funded at the federal level in the past, but have never been implemented. And now it's happening at the state level. And you're also looking toward local control and kind of galvanizing local groups in terms of initial response, but also taking the responsibility for some of those tools like data tracking so we can even quantify the issue and develop solutions. It just feels like this is a moment where something might actually happen that starts to tip that trend so that maybe we get to a point where we're reporting on a decreasing number of people going missing, um, but that that's not where we're at right now. Your thoughts on the opportunity of this moment. Yeah, the opportunity is there to grab. I think that tribal communities kind of go hand in hand with all the new broadband that's going out there and accessibility to technology. But there's also the something that happened in the last, since early 2000s and maybe in before, but a lot of the local communities were really involved in the FEMA effort and also in the incident command system through their, their um, historical cultural connection to wildland fire and learning that system. And I'm kind of tying this all together. Well, when we're working around losing a, a person, we historically knew how, how to 
pulled together to find our people, but we never voiced it like we could now with technology and with the people that have the knowledge base of how to use technology to get their voices heard. And also of, of, of this new era of, of being a, a native person in Montana, of saying, I'm not afraid to expose what's happening on reservations because it's not right. And the things that have happened to us need to be exposed. And the missing and murdered Indigenous persons movement is a highlight that sits there because it's such an atrocity that's been happening to our people that we just haven't really highlighted. And we have folks that are um, native film producers. We have folks that are, have all the right sound equipment. We have folks that know how to use databases. We have people that are on multimedia continuously posting and putting it out there. So it's also a movement of technology and knowledge and not being afraid to speak up on protecting our people. Do you think social media has played a big role in that? Hands down, hands down. Because right now, we, we don't have to wait for the lo local law enforcement to get on multimedia and say, hey, listen, I got a niece missing and she's been gone for three three days now and nobody's hearing me. And then it just spreads like wildfire because, because it really is a concern. We either find them or we get leads or we know, and then we post located, found them, we're there, we're rolling. So it, it, it is a game changer of people not being, afraid, not being afraid to step up on their own to find our own. Representative Randall, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for um, all of your explanations and for taking all of our questions. Um, we'll be following your work throughout the session. Hope to have you on again on Face the State. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. See you later. Oh gosh, the power of stories and storytelling. Um, uh, that's that's something that's actually sort of risen to the top in like recent interviews I've done on MMIW or MMIP issues. It's just sort of this sense of like now we can talk about this. Now it's it's um, you know we're kind of peeling back shame in order to um, kind of address these issues head on instead of uh, avoiding them or hiding them or um, you know frankly not bothering to um, to get good data in place so that we can address the issues. So. Really interested in seeing what their task force comes up with this session. Yeah, yeah. The last couple of sessions, Augusta, it's been really um, powerful and interesting and engaging to follow. Um, I remember in the 2019 session when they were first introducing legislation to form this task force and to address the crisis at all. And um, and it wasn't and it was an uphill battle for. I, I remember talking to Representative Ray Peppers who. Um, was a Democrat from the Northern Cheyenne who was carrying this um, along with Representative uh, Sharon Stewart Paragoy from Crow and just the struggles that they had in in really getting this legislation to land, but it couldn't have happened without them in their fight for it. And it was truly, truly incredible. So it was, it's just in, in the task force and what they've done with it. It's just like we've said, a national model. So um, yeah, we'll follow these bills. We'll keep bringing them to you and hopefully show you some examples of what they're doing on the ground throughout the session um, in different reservation and non-reservation communities, including here in Billings. So we have some good examples to bring you as the session continues. Okay. Um, uh, would like to air an interview fight with um, Representative Zoe Zephyr, who is the first transgender woman to uh, be a representative in Montana. And uh, I had an interesting interview with her as she was still representative elect, and she kind of shared her thoughts about what she was going into this session. Um, legislation um, addressing the rights of LGBTQ, transgender people are um, becoming more um, we're seeing them more nationally and in Montana. So she's kind of entering um, the body at an interesting time. And she commented a little bit about what her presence would mean in terms of uh, working on those pieces of legislation um, with her peers. And I just 
thought it'd be interesting to share with you. Some of the first bills addressing LGBTQ rights were filed um, this week. For me, that when I think about what my election means, yes, there's the the historic having a trans woman uh, in the legislature for the first time, but it's also personally it's a reminder that I'm embraced by my community here in Missoula and that. Um, that is something that I will hold close to my heart uh, as I'm doing the work up there. Um, it will be valuable to have a trans person, to have trans people alongside S.J. Howell in the legislature. Um, last session in 21, we saw a bunch of bills go um, be proposed, and some of them were stopped. But we also saw a couple pass by one vote, and I remember thinking I could change that heart. Maybe. Maybe if they knew a trans person and talked to me and got to know me as a full human, they would understand that these bills aren't what Montanans want and aren't what our state needs. Oh, you might be muted, Augusta. <laughs> so we'll be following some of the different ways that um, legislation is looking at the rights of LGBTQ people in different ways and some of the changes it might make and some of the voices that will arise um, in those discussions. So um, a bill, um, I believe it was filed this week, um, addressing healthcare for trans kids. That's been a big one around the country. That conversation is gonna happen in the Montana legislature again this year. Um, I believe it happened last session as well. It and, did, yep. Um, also, um, uh, you know, they'll, they'll be kind of a broad swath. So it's kind of a, a segment of what happens at the legislature this session that we'll be looking at, at closely. And there will be, it, I think there'll be some of the most hotly debated issues. Yeah, and we even have seen a constitutional amendment and the bill text hasn't been drafted yet. It's held, uh, but the, the draft bill has been requested for a constitutional amendment on gender um, in defining gender in Montana. So all these pieces of legislation will be following closely as Augusta said. Um, throughout the session. Last session, we saw one of the, the biggest bills on trans rights and LGBTQ rights, but especially trans rights was about um, sports and, and trans athletes in sports and um, defining who can play in what sport um, based on biological sex at birth. So that, Augusta, was a really interesting dis discussion. It's one we've heard in lots of different parts of the country, including here in Montana. So um yeah like you said they're some of the most hotly contested bills and they draw some of the largest lines of public testimony as we saw last session as well so it's interesting to hear how the public weighs in on these as well yes, our uh, mtn senior political reporter extraordinaire jonathan ambarian who stakes out of the capital jonathan thanks for being with us this evening thank you guys for having me again so we have Jonathan on every single week to talk about um, some of your reporting from this week and also what you're looking forward to next week so we can all sort of plan um, what to pay attention to. So Jonathan, go ahead. What were your big stories this week and some of the big, uh, most the highlights of the week and important work that was done? Well, this week, uh, the first week of the legislative session, frankly, it, it's, it's sort of a slow start, a slow burn. Uh, you see everyone's just trying to get sort of accustomed to where they need to be monday we had a swearing in for our lawmakers here uh, tuesday though they were starting to hear bills in committee but what we see this week and also next week is a lot of these bills early on are they're small changes they're tweaks to laws they're things that are come out of uh, requests from state agencies or or from interim committees which are have members of both parties on them. So anything comes out of an interim committee has to have bipartisan support essentially to pass on and come through to the legislature. So we're not seeing a lot of hotly talked about bills yet. Uh, this week, uh, one of the things, uh, some of the things we've been talking about are have been sort of adjacent to the legislature. We, we got some updates on uh, school districts and how they're attempting to use uh, ARPA funding, um, federal funding to try and deal with the impacts of COVID. And there was also some updates. Uh, the first year of recreational marijuana sales in the state came uh, to an end as of the start of January. And so we saw 
over $200 million in recreational marijuana sales and about 90,000 or 90 million, excuse me, in, uh, in a, uh, medical marijuana sales over the last year. So we're expecting there are probably going to be some bills on marijuana law, but uh, the hearing, there was going to be one next week, but that hearing was put off. So we'll see when that resurfaces, but we'll probably have some discussions about that later in the session. Okay, I'm pivoting to next week. We're already in, um, you know, the, the, the body jumped right into hearings because there were 4,300 plus bills. Did it end up being 4,500 that were? Well, yeah, so 4,300 bill draft okay. requests and, and, and lawmakers stress to us that not every one of these bills or even the vast majority of these bill draft requests are actually going to become bills. A, a lot of them are titles because they're something that someone thinks they may want to do something on that subject later on, but probably only a, a small percentage of those are actually going to become bills. But that being said, everyone says the leadership in, in the House and the Senate acknowledge there's a lot of bills going to be coming through this session. And so they're they're speeding things up maybe more than they normally would. But like I said, uh, a lot of the bills at this point, we're not seeing the real hotly contested ones yet. A lot of the ones this week are things like, um, yeah, just uh, tweaking some law or, and one of the things that we're seeing a lot of are uh, Governor Gianforte's talked a lot about trying to cut red tape. And so a lot of bills are coming up this session to try and simplify some parts of state code or uh, eliminate boards that they feel maybe are redundant or consolidate some boards together or responsibilities and just try and streamline the state, the operations of state government. And Jonathan, the governor held a press conference today, Thursday, um, trying to urge his tax cuts to go through. We, I assume you were there and listened yes, in. Yes, uh, we yep. were, were there for the uh, press conference. Uh, yeah, so it, it, we knew from earlier uh, from last year, even that the governor's budget plan had uh, something like a billion dollars in tax cuts, which is obviously a huge number due to the surplus that we have in the state right now. Um, and he was again uh, out there saying he hears from people out there that they want tax relief dealt with quickly. And he was saying he was encouraging people to call their lawmakers and tell them they want these tax bills to get past and go to Gianforte's desk as soon as possible. So uh, several of the bills have been introduced. Um, they haven't had any hearings scheduled for them yet, but we're expecting that would probably be coming up pretty soon. And there's even discussion, at least there was before going into the session when he first announced a billion dollars in budget cuts, or in tax cuts, excuse me, that, um, that there might be Republican lawmakers who say, that's not enough. We want more. You know, are any? Have you read any of the tax bills yet, or have you gotten a sense that there might even be bigger breaks out there proposed, whether they pass or not? You know. Well, I haven't had a chance to go through uh, all the proposals <clears throat> yet, um, but it certainly wouldn't be surprising. There, there are always some some different views on on taxation, and certainly, I think we'll probably. One of the things that we saw during the interim was that there were members of the Republican caucus who said we should call a special session and come back immediately and pass some tax relief last year out of out of the normal budget cycle because they said uh, people are, are dealing with inflation and uh, the effects of that and it's having such a hit that they wanted tax relief sooner and to a, a greater extent maybe of the of the budget surplus so i think it's certainly something that's going to be discussed great jonathan thank you so much for coming on with us this evening thank, thank you, you Jackie. and to all of our viewers um we're going to be doing the show every thursday night live here on facebook for the duration of the session so you've got three more months of us sending you notifications to please watch the show because it is important. And even in these slower moments where we're kind of going over like the meat and potatoes aspects of the of lawmaking like the rules and some of the nitpicky things, it's still critical. It's a learning opportunity for all of us to understand the process better because sometimes the most important changes come in the tiny mechanisms of how the law works and how our laws are created. So if, also, if you have any ideas 
for uh, or you're 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 curious about something or you've heard something that happened with your local lawmaker and you don't know what's going on, reach out. We're very accessible. Uh, so so don't be a stranger and uh, feel free to share the show and and make sure that it's um, uh, on your calendar every week because we'll be here at six on Thursdays. And you can also catch um, if you like streaming on the app, you can put this on your Roku TV or whatever app based uh, device you use on the local MTN News streaming app or app that year so here in billings q2 missoula k pax etc so around the state this show will be streaming 8 p.m friday through sunday so if you want to watch it in that format and we'll also have some more information and some updates from the week in that version of face the state as well so yeah and if you have questions for us or your lawmakers if you're watching this on uh, facebook live let us know comment on it and we'll bring them up thank you all for joining us thank you jackie thank you jonathan Thank you, Augusta. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Augusta. Have a great Thursday. See you next week. See you next week.